Would you turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5? I want to read from 2 Corinthians 5 and also from Romans chapter 5. First, I want to read from 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now in Romans chapter 5, I want to read this to go with our main text tonight, beginning at verse 8. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, <clears throat> we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement, or as the margin reads, by whom we have now received the reconciliation. This word atonement literally is at one -ment. And so in being reconciled to God, we are again made one with him. And of course, the only way that one can be in union with God is being in union with his son. And of course, the son, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is our reconciliation. I wanna to talk tonight about this matter of reconciliation, the fact that we are ambassadors. We're ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are going forth seeking to establish peace between the sinner and God. We do this as Jesus Christ has purchased salvation, as he has given his life's blood in order to make peace. And he is our peace who has made both one and torn down the middle wall of partition between us. He is the peace of all that will come to God by him. And so we wanna talk about reconciliation and the fact that we are instruments in this. We are ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. It was an accursed hour when our mother Eve first believed Satan's lie, put forth her hand to take of the forbidden fruit, gave to her husband, our father Adam, and he did a eat. I say that was a dark and an accursed hour because from that moment there has been enmity between man and his God, between man and his maker. As you well know, prior to that time, our parents had walked with God in the garden, in the cool of the day. They had had fellowship together. They were one. God had created man in his own image, in his own likeness, the very height of his creation. He delighted in man and man delighted in God. But then came that awful hour when Eve was tempted by the serpent and she yielded to that temptation. She believed his lie. She took of the fruit she gave to her husband and he did eat. And of course the scripture makes it very clear that it was not in Eve's disobedience that we became sinners, that we fell. It was in Adam, our federal head. And so 
the race fell then, and the enmity was, was, a, was set between man and his God. But still, even though the, the creature has waged a war that ca he cannot possibly win, uh, the scripture says, Woe unto him that striveth with his maker, and yet man is set at odds with God, he's at enmity with him, he's at war with God, and it's a battle that he can't even hope to win. The foolish moth would have for far more uh, uh, ability to win his battle with the flame than a sinner to win his battle that he has waged against God. Uh, an insignificant insect would uh, stand a better chance against the sword of a, a, a flaming angel than any man would stand in standing against his God. How foolish man is. Let the potsherds of the earth strive with the potsherds. But how foolish it is for man to strive with his maker, and yet he does. But him being in this condition, him being in this fallen condition, he's lost everything. Yet we find no overtures from man toward God. We do not find uh, any um, petitioning of the Father. We have no petitioning of God coming from man, no positioning in order to, to seek reconciliation. Man has everything to gain, and yet he, and he's got everything to lose. In fact, he's already lost everything, but he will not seek reconciliation. Since the inevitable consequences of this warfare will be man's eternal loss, man's eternal destruction, should not he be doing everything in his power to find some ground for making peace? Quite the opposite has been the case. From the very beginning, we find the guilty pair, Adam and Eve, hiding themselves from God, hiding themselves from the Creator who was their former friend, their dear friend. They had fellowship with Him. That's gone, but they're not seeking peace. In fact, the wonder of wonders, it's not the offenders who have everything to lose who seek for peace, to make peace with God, it is the offended party. It is God who needs nothing from man. It is God who is all sufficient. He has nothing to gain. And yet it is God who is reaching out to man, the self-sufficient one. He takes pity on the pair. He puts forward the message of hope. Right there, I believe immediately after they were discovered, after he called out to them, Adam, where art thou? And found the condition they were in and began to pronounce sentence upon them. At that very time, God announced his message of reconciliation. What would be the, the grounds for reconciliation between God and man? that he would put enmity between the, the, the woman, the seed of the woman and the serpent, that, he, that the seed of the woman is going to eventually bruise the head of the serpent and he is going to redeem the people. This is God's message. It was delivered to Satan, but I believe his, the grace of it was intended for our first parents. I believe that they heard it savingly. I know there's debate about that. Was, were Adam and Eve saved? Was Adam converted? Uh, did he believe uh, the message that he had heard under the saving of his soul? It's my position that he did. And it's my position that Eve did. There was a reason why that Adam changed her name to life 
that's an indication they got the message they understood there's a reason why that Eve was so overjoyed to know she was going to have a man child she believed she didn't know how far down the line the seed was going to be born she just knew the seed of the woman was going to redeem and I believe she believed that but the main reason I believe the initial reason is that God took animals and shed their blood and clothed both of them. So they were clothed by the sacrifice that he made. Their nakedness was covered. And therefore, I believe in that, in that picture, we have reason to believe that they did receive the benefit. They received the salvation that was offered through this man-child that is going to come into the world. Be that as it may, we know what is going on here, and we know that it is God, after the fall and after all of these things, delivered that message of mercy, the first gospel message ever preached, right there in the garden, the, preached to Satan directly but indirectly to our parents. He made known that he would be reconciled. He made known that he would be reconciled. What grace that is. Should he banish the whole race, who, who could have blamed him? But yet he didn't. Yes, death came. Death reigned on them. But it wasn't immediate death. They could have been consigned to hell immediately. But this course a grand space given for repentance, a, a space given uh, epochs of time in which this promise that he made is going to be brought to pass, brought to fruition, and Christ is going to come into the world. All of this has to transpire, but God is the one that reaches out. God is the one who will be reconciled. It's not our first parents. Isn't that sad? And it's still to this day, the blessed and the holy God that we have offended, that calls upon sinners to negotiate. Yes, he does. He calls upon us to negotiate. Come now and let us reason together, he says. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Come now and let us reason together. God is inviting the sinner. It should be that the sinner is on his face, on his knees, begging and pleading, please give me another chance. But it's not that way. Man doesn't seek after God. It's been that way from the time of the fall. It's God that seeks after men. What mercy. God seeks sinners. He takes the initiative. And having borne all of the cost, and it is considerable, having borne all of the cost to make a peace treaty available and possible. We read there in Romans chapter 5. We see there what the cost is. And we see how it is that we can be reconciled. We're reconciled by the blood of the cross. And being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God has given us now this ministry of reconciliation. That's what it's all about. The, the gospel is the gospel. We have it. And now he is commissioned us to take this gospel to all the world and preach it to every creature and extend this, this invitation to all sinners everywhere. You can't take the gospel to the wrong address. You can't take it to the wrong person. We are commissioned to go to every creature and say, God will be reconciled to you. You confess your sins, you repent of your sins, you believe on his son, and he will be reconciled. There will be a peace treaty signed, and you'll be at peace. 
we can say for sure that that's true because we remember when we were brought to that place of peace and what a peace and a joy it is to the soul. I know for this sinner it was that way when finally I laid down my arms and, and stopped the fight and submitted to the gospel, trusted in Christ and what peace came over my soul. And it, it has remained. But that initial, the initial knowledge that my sins had been forgiven, that God was no, no longer angry with me. He's angry with the wicked every day. It was with me. I was a child of wrath, just like others. But all of a sudden, that was gone. It was all taken away. I felt like I could float on air. I know you know what I'm talking about. You've had that experience. If you know the Lord, that's your experience too. Now, we don't enjoy the peace that we have like we should. That should keep us a smile on our face all the time. We have trials and troubles in life, and we sometimes get down in spirit, and we're not alone, all do. But my, what peace, what, what reason for joy to know that our peace is established between our soul and our Creator. And he goes even further than this, and he puts into motion the means of reconciliation, the means of getting out the message to the world. He assigns, he appoints, he calls ambassadors, and he sends them out in his name to bear the message to all the world. And this is our great delight, it's our honor, and it's our joy to be ambassadors to be messengers, to go forth and tell sinners that God will, God will be reconciled to you in Jesus Christ. Now, God does not speak immediately to men. He graciously, I don't mean that he speaks to us, of course he does, but concerning this matter of the gospel, he doesn't come in person and deliver the message himself. There is not the personal dealing. He sends his messengers. It would be impossible for anyone to face God himself and live. This is what the Lord told to Moses. But God does not speak immediately to us. He graciously condescends to speak with us in order to bring us into union with Christ by his ambassadors. Now, just let me say that as we have seen and been uh, reminded of recently, a truth that is should be very familiar to us, that we are in Christ and our reconciliation that we have is because we are in union with Christ. Our justification, our salvation depends on vital union with the Lord Jesus Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things are become new. And if we be in Christ, that is the place of our acceptance. That is our oneness. That is truly our reconciliation. But ordinarily, there can be no union with Christ without the offer of the gospel and an overture of him to our souls in the gospel. The scripture says, how shall they believe on him of whom they've not heard? How, how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Of course, Paul there in Romans 10 is quoting from, from Isaiah 52. It's both Testaments. This is well known that God sends preachers. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Beautiful feet believers have as they carry this gospel. But these ambassadors speak in God's place 
in Christ's stead, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. We are standing in Christ's own stead, beseeching men to be reconciled to God. I think of the honor that that is, to stand in Christ's stead and to have him to call us and to appoint us to that high calling. Of these ambassadors announce God's treaty of peace. Be you reconciled to God. There's the announcement. These ambassadors are to humbly and sincerely and compassionately deal with men. We go and we pray them. We pray you in Christ's stead. We plead with you in Christ's stead. Be you reconciled to God. Now it's clear then that the preaching of the gospel by Christ's ambassadors is the means appointed for the rec reconciling and bringing home the sinner to Christ. That's God's means. But what I want to consider, first of all, is some of the things that this implies. That which is implied by Christ dealing with sinners by ambassadors. I put together a short list here, and certainly it's not exhaustive. But it implies that men, that man is a fallen apostate creature, now out of a state of favor and friendship with his God. And if so, there is war between man and God. And if there is no war with heaven, then what is the need of an ambassador? You don't need ambassadors of peace if there's no threat of war or if there is no war. So that certainly is an implied truth. It's in the preaching of the gospel that God is reconciled to man. We, we see that truth also very clearly set forth, or implied, I should say. Thirdly, that God is showing singular grace and amazing love to sinful man. God is under no obligation. We've already said he has nothing to gain in this. Man has everything to lose, but God has nothing to gain. And I say that knowing that you know that according to God's own purposes of grace, he has a plan to fulfill and it must be fulfilled. But at the same time, speaking in an absolute sense, God is, is completely self-sufficient, needs nothing to make himself more complete. So speaking in that sense, he needs nothing. He has nothing to gain in this. And that's not to deny that believers are not the, the Lord's portion. He says they are, that they are his reward, that they are the reward of his travail. In that sense, he gains that which he has purchased. But I'm speaking absolutely that God needs nothing would anybody say that God needs anything? He says in his word that he doesn't. And we know that he's completely self-sufficient. But So this is amazing love that God reaches out to sinful man. It's singular grace that the one who has no obligation whatsoever reaches out like this. And he offers a treaty of peace. He did not do so with the angels that fell. There was no peace treaty put together for them. They fell. We're created a little lower than the angels, the scripture says. Man fell and this glorious gospel treaty is put together. This peace treaty is put together at such great expense to God and his son involving the entire Trinity and the holy angels are so amazed with this that they desire to look into it, the scripture says. They want to know about this. As brilliant as they are and as wonderful a creatures as they are, 
This is beyond them. They look at what God is doing for man. It's not like they're angry about it. They just, they're just, they just marvel. Certainly if angels marvel, we ought to. And we're the ones that are the beneficiaries of this. And he pleads. God does all this and then he pleads. I pray you. He pleads with rebels. I pray you in Christ's stead. God pleading with rebels to accept his peace. Now that God has placed great dignity. This is another thing that we know from this that is implied here that God places great dignity and honor upon the gospel ministry. Whoever is involved with it, the preachers and the, the, the congregation and all who are involved in the gospel ministry, there is a great dignity in this ministry. Ambassadors represent the prince. They represent the king of kings. He's the one that sends us out. The value of the gospel minister is in the message that he preaches. That's our value. I'll get to that in a minute. But you see here that the, uh, the prince sends us out and the dignity that is involved. You realize to despise the ambassador is to despise God himself. You go and knock on a door and you try to give someone the gospel and they want nothing to do with you. They treat you like dirt. They slam the door in your face. They may insult you. You're God's ambassador. To despise you is to despise the Lord himself. You're there representing him. You're carrying his word, his message. The word delivered by Human agents lacks nothing in authority. Just because he sends it by the agent, if we deliver the message in truth, just as we received it from the prince, if we deliver it, then we have just the same authority as he. Not in our word, but in his word. Now, the value of the gospel minister is in his message. This treasure has been put into earthen vessels. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the previous chapter, and verse 7. For we have this treasure, this treasure of the gospel, in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So you want to know the value of the minister? It is the message that he delivers. The message is the treasure. What is the vessel? What is the minister? He's an earthen pot. He's a clay pot. And a flawed one at that. Clay pots are not worth much. All they're good for is containing things that are put in them. But when, the, the, when that which is placed in the clay pot is the treasure, the invaluable treasure of the gospel, that is priceless. He did not put this treasure into golden chalices. He didn't put it into golden chests that are uh, diamond studded. No, clay pots. That's what we are. But we have a treasure that is worth more than the world. We have a treasure that is the gospel. And we have a message of peace that God is sending to all the world. And we get to carry it. He has put this treasure into earthen vessels. Something else. That the gospel ministers are under a strict obligation. To be faithful to their commission. Faithful to the one who sent them with his commission, with his word. We are not free to alter it. We deliver it as it is. How arrogant that is. 
for a preacher of the gospel, called of God to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then to decide to enhance that gospel with his own thoughts, to take this out and put that in, and as they say, make it more palatable. Talking about a postmodern gospel. Why, we can't expect to reach this age with that old gospel. We've got to have something for this generation. We have one gospel. And it's for all generations. And it's in us clay pots. And we are to carry that gospel as it is and not change it. We have no authority to do that. The word is out that Nancy Pelosi, now that she's no longer going to be Speaker of the House, has put in a bid for an ambassadorship. She wants to go to Italy. Well, knowing what we know about Nancy, I just wonder how faithful she's going to be as an ambassador to, to represent who she's representing. What is she going to be there for? Back under the Obama administration, Joe Biden was sent to Ukraine. He was an ambassador. In that, in that capacity, he went. We had promised a billion dollars of aid to Ukraine. So Biden brags about it. He went over there and, and he withheld that, that, that billion dollars until they fired somebody that he wanted fired that was threatening his son. Now that's not being an ambassador for the United States. That's not being an ambassador for your president. That's taking matters into your own hands. That's representing yourself. I'm afraid there are a lot of preachers who do the same thing. They represent themselves. They cut out a pretty good swath for themselves. But we have a king. We have one Lord that we represent. And he's given us his word. And he, he has made it clear. His, his word does not change. And we don't change it. We carry the message as it is and we represent our Lord and our Savior as ambassadors. The removal of a sound ministry. This tells us that the removal of a sound ministry is a very great judgment upon the people. This nation has been so blessed since its inception with faithful ministers of the gospel faithful Christians that believe the word of God. But when God begins to remove faithful ministries, that is a sign of judgment. It is a sign that there is something coming that is not good. The removal of ambassadors presages ensuing war in nations. Bring the ambassadors home. When God is calling his ambassadors and not replacing them, what does that tell us? What is the message in that? The removal of a sound gospel ministry is a very great judgment upon a nation. We keep praying God raise up more preachers that will preach your truth more to carry this message, revive our nation, and we pray that he will. That's what we desire. But we can know as we see more and more the gospel dwindling and God, true, faithful gospel preachers not to be found. We can know that it presages war. Now, what God has acted in great wisdom here and great grace in negotiating a treaty of peace by human ambassadors. This is God's wisdom. Well, he could have done it other ways, and we've all heard that and we've said it. God didn't have to use us. He could have used angels, how much better they could have been. He could have used whatever means he pleased. 
but he chose to make human beings his ambassadors, those that have been redeemed, those that have been reconciled to him, then he sends them out to reconcile others. He sends them out as his ambassadors. And that is in wisdom. I said before, if he dealt personally, his majesty would overwhelm those that he would approach. If he used angels, they could not truly sympathize. Holy angels couldn't sympathize with, with what fallen man is going through, we can. When we go to a sinner with the gospel, we go to an unsaved sinner, we're just a saved sinner going to an unsaved sinner. We was just like him. And therefore, we can sympathize with him. God has, in his vast wisdom, his reasons for doing all that he does, but surely this had to have some something to do with why he would use us clay pots for his ambassadors. We can relate, can't we? That which is the great concern to us, that which should be our great concern, it is the greatest and most blessed purpose that God ever had in the world, reconciliation. He's put his all into this. He's invested his son into this. This was the subject of the eternal counsels. This is the greatest thing that God does so far as this world is concerned the restoring of man to that former friendship that he had with God. And he doesn't halfway do it. We're told that we put off the old man, we put on the new and the renewing of our minds, that we are created anew in the image of God. Restored image. And so this is quite a big deal. God has invested himself in this, that God should be reconciled after such a dreadful thing as man's sin and his fall. Wonderful. That God should be reconciled to man and not to angels. Astonishing. They're held in chains of darkness to this day. And they will never be reconciled. that God should be unholy or that he should be holy and thoroughly reconciled to man so that man, to him, no wrath remains. There's nothing against us. What a wonder that is. What a further wonder it is. No wrath remains. That God should be Freely reconciled to sinners. That should be marvelous. Free. There's no charge. He doesn't demand anything except that we repent of our sins, confess our sins, and seek Christ. Seek reconciliation. The whole price of it has been paid. He doesn't require that we do anything to contribute to it except just accept it, receive it that God should be finally and eternally reconciled to believers is the excellence of our message. And that which gives effectual power to these ambassadors and their message. What is that power? We talked about that earlier in doctrine class. What is that power? The gospel, beyond all question, has the power to convince, to humble, to change, to change the hearts of sinners. But what is its power? It's not the mere message itself. Wonderful message that we have, but it's not the mere message itself. 
God is determined by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It's not foolish to us, but appears foolish to the world. And that's what he has chosen. That's the method that he has chosen to get out this gospel and to preach this message of reconciliation through the foolishness of preaching. But this message does not necessarily save. It doesn't necessarily reconcile. Fire will necessarily burn. But the gospel does not necessarily save those that hear it. Its power is not in the messenger. We know that. It's not in the earthen vessel. The effectiveness of the gospel lies in the power of the Spirit of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. Ministers are like trumpets, which make no music if breath be not breathed into them. We have no music, no uh, joyful sound, unless the Holy Spirit breathes through these instruments and makes it a joyful sound and causes people to hear. When you consider all these things about the gospel, about this message of reconciliation, how inexcusable are those who continue in a state of enmity. When God woos them to be reconciled, when the offended one takes the initiative comes after the sinner, be reconciled to me. How loathsome and obstinate, incurable must be the disease, which is aggravated by the only proper remedy there is for it. And yet we find that to be the case sometimes. People find it so irritating. We get so angry at it. What is there to be angry at? The offended God coming, offering reconciliation for which he's paid the enormous price to make it possible. Arranged everything and brought it to your doorstep. Brought it to you. What is to be offended at? But that's the great mystery, isn't it? We ought to carefully examine the evidence of our own reconciliation. Am I reconciled to God? Those who never felt themselves enemies cannot possibly be reconciled. And there are those like that. They'll contend with you. I've not done anything wrong. They'll tell you they know God. They'll tell you they love God. And they always have. You know, that's, that's what's usually added. But those that have never felt themselves enemies can't possibly become friends with God. They cannot be reconciled. Those who are not made enemies of sin cannot be friends of God. You can't serve God and mammon you can't be friends with sin and serve sin and serve God at the same time. So that it prohibits reconciliation. Those who were never reconciled to the things of God were never reconciled to God himself. Those reconciled to God will be reconciled to his word They'll be reconciled to his house. They'll be reconciled to everything to do, everything to do with God. And so those that are reconciled to God are going to be reconciled to the things of God, the things that, that believers delight in. We weren't always that way. This is the change. Old things have passed away. All things are becoming new to the new creature in Christ. 
And if that evidence is not there, there's no evidence of reconciliation. But be you reconciled to God. If there be any here tonight that are not reconciled, you're still at enmity. Or any that are viewing tonight, go to meeting. You've never reconciled. You've never been reconciled. You're still at enmity. Our message is very simple. We pray you. We beg you. In Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in him. Receive him. And be reconciled to God.